had to in my head like come up with a good explanation of what what what's the meaning of it and the meaning is like very social like for me my understanding of it is like we call everything is algorithm so everything like in your phone or you know anything you use it's all algorithms like deterministic algorithms then you have like machine learning is like it's like fancy algorithms and then ai is everything that is like you know that does not exist and it's like you know uh, so it's like just an imaginative type of uh, stuff, but yeah, Oof. that's good. Good question. It's the the million dollar question. Where are you heading? It's like when uh, people present at uh, conferences and stuff. Someone will ask, uh, you know, so wh why? <laughs> yeah, why? Why are you doing that? <laughs> what, what? What is it for? <laughs> it's like yeah, can't, I don't know. Yeah, it's. Uh, uh there's no uh, real answer but uh you know if you ask someone that uh, if you ask 100 people at google what is it they do uh, you'll get 100 different answers so so it's kind of same same thing it's the google the next the google slash uh, open ai for biomedical data that's you know <laughs> that's the <laughs> you know so i don't have to explain what it is you know <laughs> Uh, epilepsy is a bit like that as well because yeah a lot self-reporting so uh, psychogenic you know a lot of like psychogenic stuff well yeah because psychogenic yeah because this these patients get essentially that that's actually what i'm interested in now is uh yeah because i'm i mainly have background in uh well in neuro in neural implants in hearing but uh, obviously specifically with an implant so that's hard to do any research with unless you have access to patients every time i talk about my worry like if, uh, i had someone asking me oh so do, do you have an implant do you have a... <laughs> i don't i don't think the company would have like agreed to implant someone like myself because i would start hacking to you know into the device and see what else i can do with it and stuff so they i think they i would not pass the selection criteria for the how synchronous is even a thing like i mean not not as bad as a uh, neural what is it neural the you know the twitter implant what is it called <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i just didn't want i just didn't want to mention the name <laughs> uh but but yeah but synchronous is like uh, there's so many questions about I can't, no, I can't believe like it's became a thing. Like it's, um, well, yeah, let's put it this way. It's definitely not going to become the net. Like if, 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 if it's be, if someone is, if like government would have thinking it's going to become like the next cochlear implant, it's not happening. It's definitely not happening. It's like a super invasive, uh, pr like super problematic procedure. You know, that's not, it's, it's, we're talking, was it 1% or 1% or 1% kind of thing that will be actually getting it. Cause they, they say it's like less invasive, uh, device or whatever, like, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, there's huge, like there's, this just basic like questions that no one addresses. Like, I mean, people talk about it like nonstop. Normally when they put, the uh, this because uh, the chant is a standard procedure isn't it you know the when they open uh, occlusions in uh, arteries in, in the brain right so that's the, but then they leave it there and it's it just stays part of it no one talks about the fact well first this one has a lead connected to it and that lead <laughs> is quite chunky and it sits in the you know in the vessel <laughs> continuously you know to connect to the electrodes uh like the bunch of electrodes is essentially like having one electrode as far as the brain is concerned as far as your uh, special um uh, special resolution the electrodes are just bunched all together they sit between the hemispheres you normally don't record from there so if you look at like 10 20 eg recordings like then you know the electrodes they do put electrodes on you know uh, a midline but uh, you don't get much uh, data from them because you're essentially getting like the noise between the two hemispheres so that's where it's sitting like in midline and it will be the size of it i don't know how many electrodes they have like eight or ten or whatever but they're so small and so bunched up together that it's essentially like having one electrode uh, so the special resolution whatever of it is uh, you definitely cannot stimulate with it obviously uh, you can only record 
and you're essentially recording like with an equivalent of one uh, one electrode the because it's not like you know your dbs electrodes when you you know are in a specific region of the brain and then you record from single single neurons whatever you're like too far from single single cells uh yeah so it's super invasive i kind of like it will be suitable for again if if normally if say your i don't know like the cochlear plant is like uh, it's one percent of uh you know, whatever amount of people you have uh, that have uh, hearing loss, then the cochlear implant will be suitable for, you need sensory neural hearing loss for, to be a candidate for a cochlear implant. So that's 1%. Within that sensory neural hearing loss, you will be again like 1%. So, but that's pretty much, you know, it. With this thing, you will go into like 1% of 1 of 1 of 1 of, one of like 10, yeah, <laughs> like 10 folds. But it's not going to go, how is it going to, like, okay, that's where it starts and how, and that's where it ends. Like, how is it going to go? <laughs> unless you start implanting, like, multiple of them, unless you can connect to it wirelessly, whatever, which is impossible, it's the, it's, it's not scalable. Like, the Synchro, Synchron has some good uh, papers uh, where they compare different types of electrodes, for example. Uh, there, there's and uh, you know um, sh animal subjects implanted with uh, two other types of electrodes. Well, so I'm just saying, yeah, the way you process the data and analyze everything is very, uh, very different. Uh, so yeah, and once you pull data from different uh, experiments together, yeah, you get all sorts of problems. Yeah, if a lot of like machine learning algorithms do not uh, do not converge. Come down to you know where is it was rec you know recording from, what the the surface area of the electrode, things like that. You know the the um, in this in this case the the main problem is this electrode is sitting in 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 blood, so it will be essentially recording mainly mainly you will have an artifact of uh, you know the blood moving moving. Uh, you know, you will have what's that physical effect where you have like a magnetic field out of, uh, you know, moving liquid. The cochlear implant has the same thing because it's a stimulating device and sitting in the middle, in the inner ear, in the cochlear structure, which has a liquid, uh, liquid in it. And they, and yes, they, they stimulate the, within that liquid, but still manage to get the neural uh, response. Uh, yeah, no, they had some, uh, some good, uh, uh, papers coming out like the obviously now that nothing comes out because it's all proprietary commercial yeah that's the other thing like you say oh um like um, you know who who guarantees you're gonna see any of this data ever <laughs> I, I i i i believe you won't unless the company uh, you know collapses and which you know yes it's not going to be good for patients but uh, you know but for anyone to get hold of the data it's not happening it's not going to happen with the you know with the current structure of the company so they have some uh, defense invest uh, u.s government a uh, bunch of uh, american companies well the headquarters now in the u.s so yeah it's definitely <laughs> Because I'm looking at, the, I don't know if you heard of uh, NeuroVista study. There was like 15, 14, 15 patients in Melbourne back in ages ago. Um, the American company, they had a full-fledged like uh, implant that they developed like for, I don't know, like they spent $120 million or something. And they were doing the study in uh, in Melbourne. So, But the company went under, so the, the data is in the public domain. So that's, you know, yes, yeah, it's really no, a lot of it is really noisy. So no, normally EG data, the problem with it, like external recordings, you need to do them. So you can't record just uh, EEG. You never record EEG. They don't record EEG. They record a lot of like muscle motion artifacts, uh, the whole, the whole lot. There's very little EEG in it. And there is no way to tell unless you do like, so the only useful if you did like a, uh, you know, like in the, in, in the MRI machine, you know how you put like a dead fish in an MRI, you get a reading? Have you heard of that paper? There was a paper of them putting like a dead fish in an MRI scanner and getting getting that out of it. So MRI is only useful when you do, you know, those, uh, what do they call the a bo a ball? When you rotate between stimulations, so you know, they show them 
uh, images, say faces and trees, and they keep showing face tree, face tree, and then they show face face, and then you supposed to you know, but you do it like a gazillion of times. Ah, yeah, and a functional mirror. Yeah, well, yeah. So unless you did like a structural, but it doesn't tell you anything about the activity of the brain, right? So I'm saying, yeah, so I'm saying EEG, if you wanted to, like, to get any clinically relevant EEG externally, because you're essentially not recording, well, you can't assume, you have to assume you're only recording bugger all EEG. So you have to uh, do, uh, what is it called, an ERP, evoke, uh, evoke response potential. So when you record EEG as a response to flashing lights or whatever it is. So it's it's highly dependent on the um, you know the quality of the study design kind of thing, as opposed to with like an implantable device like Synchron or any DBS recording stuff where you actually record the mostly EEG and then well so so yeah so it depends what what is it you're trying to to do right well over time yeah because you repeated the same thing like a million of times so you start seeing uh, response to that stimulus. Yeah, the snowball, snowball, is it snowball? Oddball, oddball. When you hit them with uh, the same same thing 100 times and one of them is different, yeah. My background in uh, epilepsy, so obviously you can't do that in epilepsy. It's totally not applicable. Like, there's no point. <laughs> like, well, because the, so say, trying to predict or detect seizures, right? Well, there's no oddball for that, is there? <laughs> the oddball is... Uh, you know, if uh, some patients having like a seizure, like a couple seizures a, a year. So so that's your oddball if you're doing like uh, millions of, uh, you know, like if you record throughout the entire year, like every day it will be your oddball because every day they didn't have a seizure. <laughs> but but that, that's pretty accurate already, I, thought, I, I, I would think. I haven't done any sleep or I looked at some data set that had sleep uh, EEG data. But that's one is... I thought that one was, yeah, you need your problem that is like not too difficult. Like, so, so say detecting seizures is, is okay. Uh, predicting seizures is like too difficult in some patients. Like, so, so in some patients, for example, like when you, they know, you know, it's, the seizures are so obvious that you don't need to do anything. You won't even need like a EEG at all. You, they, they know they're having a seizure. If you look at them, you know they're having a seizure. So, uh, so from like a video footage, any neurologist will be able to tell, you know, a trainee will be able to tell they're having a seizure. So I'm saying you need to choose your problem. But then I thought in sleep, you know, the sleep stages, EEG sleep stages, that's been, that will be like a too easy kind of, you know, task. It's, uh, you know, Dan and Dansky. You know, it's like you're playing chess versus uh, playing checkers or something <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> I don't know, but but it sounds like uh, you, you, yeah. When when you go this way, like when you're trying to find a problem and then solve it with machine learning, I, I would say, you know, uh, well, yeah, you can apply it to anything, right? But uh, the 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 interesting problems is say how does it yeah how does it transferable to say another data set so for example you were recording you know with one uh, EEG device in certain conditions you know say in the clinic and then you say record with the same device at home or or you know say you know same place but a different device and then you you had your uh, you know machine learning uh, algorithm that's relying on whatever thousands of different parameters which no one knows what the parameters are and then you you know, try to apply the same algorithm on a different data set and all of a sudden performance drops by 50%. So it's like, what, okay, what does it mean? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Well, there's a big thing between like the difference between uh, detection and prediction. Well, essentially, essentially prediction is detection, but early, like early, <laughs> early, like, well, because in prediction, you still need to detect something that something have changed uh, in, say, in EEG. So it just, yeah, it just, it's, it's, you can think of it as detection, just like early, early detection of something, because you still need some, uh, sig signature, uh, you know, signal changing. It's it just, it's, it will be called prediction because it's like, it looks like magic because, because yes, if you give, uh, give it to a neurologist, you know, on the standard, uh, EEG software that they use, and then do, they don't see anything, but then you did some manipulation to it and then you do see something, but you still need to show it. That's what I'm saying. There's no... You know, it won't be like, uh, 
I don't believe it will be something that relies on like thousands, you know, of uh, unknown parameters. You only have a bunch, you know, you only have amplitude, frequency, you have um, interaction between channels, you know, like uh, a phase, phase locking between channels. Maybe you can, you know, stretch it to another, uh, you know, four or five parameters all up. So it kind of needs to, it will need to be like an, a not, not a black box kind of thing. But, but you have to, how alert you are, wouldn't you then look at like a pupil dilation or something else, a heart, heart rate, things like that, and try to optimize for it and then try to bring yourself into that state, uh, Seizures is a good is a good example because you you learn a lot about like uh, so you have a lot of like things that that just work and then once you do like yeah, epilepsy research you realize how a lot of these things like do not work anymore. So with seizures, for example, there is a big thing about for example the the that study that I uh, mentioned the NeuroVista study they had some sort of pager that will indicate like the likelihood of of them having a seizure, and it was like green, yellow, red, whatever the you know so. So the idea was that if if you detect something in the brain uh, that uh, potentially you know being trained to predict a seizure, then the patient can like sit down. And question is, how do you know that fact that you alerted them didn't actually prevent the seizure from happening in the first place? So it's always like a chicken and egg kind of situation. So how do you know like in this case? Yeah. So it's relevant to what you just said because it's like it's the same thing. You know the logic behind it is that yeah if you if you gave me this feedback, if you provide me a neuro, neural feedback, how do you know the feedback is not what... Um, so, for example, if you faked it, so what I would be interested in, if you had a device like that, which I'm sure it's already like available in some form or other, um, you know, with all these uh, focusing concentration apps. What I'm interested in is if you did like a fake, uh, you did a study with one of those, you know, EEG wearables wh which they meditate with, and you did a study where you provided them fake uh, data. So for example, they, you know, you actually record some, well, a lot of them just record noise. I'll be, they'll be lucky if they're recording any EEG whatsoever. That, that that's first thing why you know that that's for sure like just because the quality of the signal that they record they don't measure impedance they don't measure you know the signal quality they just record noise and whatever but assumingly so you recorded this noise but then you actually gave it becomes like a behavioral study uh, psychophysiology where you present them like different feedback and and you can tell that that feedback i could make them with that feedback give me now thousand patients and i can modify that feedback and make them perform better and the eg will be just a placebo thing you need the eg because it makes it more reliable the more invasive it is if especially if you yeah, implant something, then they, you know, you could fake him, like fake implant, you know, put the, you know, hypothetically, right? Put the patient under, you know, anesthesia and then don't actually do anything. Just when they wake up, they just have like a, a, a band-aid and it will be huge. That will, I'm saying that will be like most of the results will be contributed by the type of feedback that you provide as opposed to the actual signal that you record, because the signal is noise, and especially with external EEG recordings, unless it's being prepped in a certain way, like they do in the clinic, where they prep the skin, you know, remove that skin, uh, glue the hell, you know, the hell out of the electrode to the scalp. You know, the glue that they use in the clinic, like it's, it's, it's the type of glue that if you rip the, yank the electrode, like your, you will rip the, the, the skin, the scalp will come, come off. And you use like electro, uh, actually the contact between the electrode and the, it's not metal to skin. It's that uh, conductive paste, whatever. Anyway, no one preps, preps properly. <laughs> you, if, if, unless you did that proper prepping, the signal that you're looking at is 90% is, uh, noise as opposed to, you know, the other way around where you have impedance below, you know, it has to be in the hundred of uh, ohms, not kilo ohms. Normally those wearables will be, the impedance will be in the kilo ohms. So they will just filter your mains, you know, hum, you know, your 50 or 60 hertz uh, mains, and they just look at uh, noise. If you left the electrode on the table, you'll get the same recording. Yeah, look up the dead fish uh, MRI study. It was a full fledged like public, like a proper publication. Yeah, one of those fake publications, you know, where they send a reviewer uh, something um, and then later tell them, oh, it actually was a dead fish. 
whereas the study is legit. Like, you know, when they do like studies of studies of how, um, you know, research is being conducted. Kind of thing. That's the, I, I stopped reading and the first thing that I do with papers now, I, I, I open, I open a paper, I go straight to the data availability section. If it's one of those, uh, you know, if there's no link and the data is available, like right now, <laughs> and I can actually, I'm closing that paper. You know, if it's one of those standard uh, contact the, the, you know, the corresponding author on the reasonable request, the data will be made available from the corresponding author. And it's like, yeah, that's not available. See you later. Like it's, it's not reproducible. It's not, I can't do anything with it. Cause even if they, you know, uh, I think it, it's a legal thing where, you know, if I actually contact them, I can either get it via freedom of information, <laughs> you know, if it was like government funded research or whatever, but that's, I don't have time for this crap. Or um, they do it so when they send me some sort of link of some sort of metadata, not the actual, they won't, actually, they won't ever release the actual data. They will be just, you know, giving me some samples of the meta metadata that was pro-processed or pre-processed, whatever. And then I'll have to sign like a disclaimer that I won't be, you know, talking about it or doing anything with it. So I was like, it's useless. No, now, now so, so say when NIH uh, funding studies now, I can, yeah, uh, they actually require that for the data to be, for the data to be published as well. And that's actually pretty good because they now consider, so if you publish your data, so say if you're collecting data in your PhD, whatever, you can actually make a publication just by publishing your data. Well, not just, it's still hard to publish your data because you need to prepare it in a certain way for it to be, you know, legible and tell, you know, uh, like a repository, like a GitHub or whatever. They have a scientific repositories for, there's a lot of EEG. I have a, a blog actually about it, like a whole list of repositories like that. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm still, it's work in progress. I'm trying to make this like a big, uh, not big, it doesn't have to be big, but just a table where you yeah, have a data set um, and then no, the main thing about it is I give it like a, like an accessibility score and uh, so the quality score and so currently I only have that NeuraVista implant data that I actually looked at uh, in uh, quite a lot of detail and yeah, I have a high quality because it's actual EEG, it's like an implant EEG. Data accessibility, yeah, requires registration, but uh, I think anyone can, you know, register and it's on ieg.org. Anyway, they have like some other data sets as well. But then, then you have the, yeah, essentially Figshare, Zenodo, Physionet is a big one. So Physionet, for example, you could, uh, so say if you're collecting data in your PhD, yeah, say Figshare takes any data, Zenodo will take any data. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm not sure if all of them will give you a DOI, but uh, Physionet will definitely will. Any, any data can be good. It's, it's also, I think for them to make it like a publishable data set for it to be considered a publication, it's just the way you format it. So it's more or less of, you know, what it is and, you know, how big it is, but more, you know, how a uh, manageable and, you know, if I look at it, you know, if someone wants to essentially, you know, reproduce your results or whatever, it's like how, you know, how organized it is i i go around them like in a circle so if you mention to me something if you actually if you actually reviewed if you actually like in detail like reviewed some of them and you give me feedback or something i would go i'll put it on my list i'll go back to it and you know try and improve it make it better 